questions? I should, uh, all right, let's get started. So, um, an introduction to computational social science. So, one question that you might wonder about, um, it's a question sometimes people ask me, is what is computational social science? So this is a summer institute in computational social science, so it seems like the first thing we should do is say what that is. And I think it's kind of anything that's cool. So now we're kind of done. We can go have coffee. And um, my talk is over. No, I, I, I'm sort of joking, but I'm sort of serious here. That is, I think when you have something that's new and changing quickly, it doesn't make a lot of sense to try to define it very formally at the beginning because you end up shutting down a lot of possibilities. So in general, we take a very big tent view of the field here. And I think a sort of motivation for this, if you think about the organic food movement in the US. So when that movement was starting in the 70s, people who supported this movement, they really supported a lot of different things. Some people meant organic as in like no pesticides. Other people supported organic, meaning local. Um, other people supported it because they thought it tasted better. Like there's a huge range of things that went into the organic food movement. And all of those different communities were able to work together until the organic food movement became a big thing that had a big impact on society. And if at the very beginning, the people that cared about organic as no pesticides said, oh, you people that care about local farming, you're not organic. That's not what organic means. Uh, and oh, you people that like this just because it tastes good, you're missing the point. That would, so if you start building walls around people who want to be a part of a community, you end up cutting off a lot of the growth of the community. So in general, this is why this is actually what I think is a good definition. Um, but I realize in terms of setting the tone for what we're going to do here, I'll try again and sort of what is computational social science. And so what I'll do is I'll give you an example of a study that I think illustrates a lot of the themes that we'll see repeatedly throughout the two weeks. So you, these are themes that you've probably already seen a lot in your own work or the work that other people have done. And these are themes I think will come back over and over and over again throughout these two weeks. So this study is one by Josh Blumensock and colleagues about predicting poverty and wealth from mobile phone uh, metadata. This was published in Science, I think last year. Um, and the problem that they were trying to address is eradicating poverty. So that's like a, I think everyone can sort of get behind that goal. That's a good thing. Everyone cares about that. Um, so there are a lot of challenges if you want to achieve that goal. One of these challenges, a very modest challenge, is you don't actually even know how much poverty there is and where it is. So in the US and in other uh, wealthy countries, we're used to the idea that governments collect very good national statistics and we have a good sense of sort of what is happening. But in many other countries, the governments do not collect this kind of information. And so it's hard for you to even necessarily know where the poverty is and how much of it there is and how is that changing over time. And so what we'd like to do is have some system that allows us to measure these things so that we can allocate our policy resources effectively and track changes over time to see if what we're doing is, was working. Um, and so generally, there's kind of two ways that you can do this. One is with a census, where you interview everyone. Censuses are great because they give you very granular estimates. You can make estimates for very specific geographic regions or social groups. But the problem with censuses is that they're slow and expensive. And so the alternative main way people do this is a sample surveys, where you pick 1,000 people and interview them. Those are much cheaper and faster, but the problem with those is that they have, they can't produce very granular estimates. You can't get estimates for very small geographic units or for very small social units. So what if you could somehow create a system that combined the best features of censuses and surveys? So this would be a very attractive thing. It would allow you to do a lot of measurements that you could have never done previously. And that's what this paper is about. That's the sort of challenge that motivates this paper. So the way they did it, though, is they combined uh, the, the starting point for what they wanted to do is they got the call records from the largest mobile phone provider in Rwanda. So 1.5 million customers. All of the calling data and texting data from these people, when the call took place, 
the location of the caller and the location of the receiver. Now, these call records are a tremendously rich data source, but they don't actually have the information that the researchers cared about. So they actually want a measure of poverty, and that's not in the call records. So what they did is they also then collected that in a survey. So for a, a random sample of 1,000 people from these call records, they actually called them, and they asked them a bunch of survey questions using well-developed scales to measure poverty. And then what they did is they linked these two things together. And we'll talk much more on Thursday about the details of how they did all this. Uh, for now, I'm just going to give you a sketch. Uh, so basically, they took these call records, and then they did a process that's often called feature engineering. And they created a big matrix where there's one row for each person and one column for each feature, or what social scientists would often call variables. So this could be things like number of outgoing calls or ratio of outgoing calls to incoming calls. But it could also be stuff that's much more complicated, like triadic closure of all your calls on weekends, or all kinds of crazy, crazy, crazy things. So they built all these features. Then they built a machine learning model that tries to predict what you'll say in a survey based on the features of your call records. And then there's a lot of details about how they built that model of the school that we'll talk about on Thursday. Then they use that model to essentially estimate what everyone would say. Um, so by doing this survey of 1,000 people, they were able to impute <coughs> the call records for 1.49 million people, uh, the, the survey answers. Then they also estimated people's location because of the, um, the call data has the location of the tower where they made the call. So they were used that to estimate the residence location. So how did it work? So this plot shows the uh, ability for the model to actually predict the wealth in a cross-validation. So essentially, they would take the data, they would hold out 10% of the data, train the model on the other 90%, and see how well they could recover that 10%. And so here is the predicted wealth, and here is the actual wealth. And so it does something. This is, I'm not going to say this is a great result. We'll talk much more about how we can interpret this result later. But there's clearly some signal here. Now, the next thing, though, is you might say, well, this is not what we care about. We don't care about the ability to in-sample prediction. We care about measuring things about Rwanda. And this is all of people who have mobile phones. And that might be a very different population than the people in Rwanda in general. So how would you know if this thing is actually working? So fortunately. A few years prior to this, the Demographic and Health Survey had done a high quality survey in Rwanda using probability based sampling techniques. So, for those of you who don't know the Demographic and Health Surveys, these are kind of like the gold standard for traditional surveys in developing countries. So, then we can say, well, let's compare this new method to the estimates that you get from a sort of traditional gold standard te uh, measurement technique. And these are the results. So, these are now aggregated to the regional level, so there's 30 regions. <clears throat> so this is the prediction from the call records. This is from the Demographic and Health Survey. So you see it's like not exactly the Demographic and Health Survey, but there's definitely some signal there. And we also need to remember that the Demographic and Health Survey is not perfect either. Uh, and so we'll talk much more about how to evaluate this when we talk about surveys later. But so you may now say, well, like that all you've done is you've created this new measurement system with unknown error properties, and you can reproduce something that we already knew how to do, where we understand the error properties much better. Uh, but there is one thing that I left out about this, which is that the technique using the mobile phone data was 10 times faster and 50 times cheaper. So 50 times cheaper is like, a lot cheaper, uh, just to be clear. And that, no, but like 50 is a lot, right? It's not like 10% cheaper. It's like a lot. Uh, so just to be clear, this does not mean that I think we should cut the budget of demographic and health service by a factor of 50. I think that would be a bad idea. I think we should do 50 times more demographic and health service. So right now, these um, surveys are done roughly every five years because of cost. 
But in many wealthy countries, we don't have to wait every five years to see what's happening in the country. Like in the US, we have monthly indicators of things like unemployment and so on. And so rather than doing it once every five years, maybe we should do it once a month. And if we were 50 times cheaper, that kind of thing would become possible. And if that kind of thing became possible, that would open up lots of opportunities for policymakers and for scientists. So what I like about this study as an exemplar of what computational social science is, is it is both computational and social science. So part of the techniques that they use very much come out of machine learning, and I talked about feature engineering, which is a very kind of data science-y term. But part of it is collecting survey data, which is something that social scientists traditionally do, and the goals that motivate them are very much social science goals. So you'll notice that the thing that they compared to was the demographic and health survey. They didn't say try five different machine learning models and see which one has a better ability to make predictions because that wasn't motivated exactly by machine learning goals. It was using machine learning in the service of social science goals. But to do this project well, you need to understand some of what we traditionally learn in social science and some of what we traditionally learn in data science. Um, it also, this study is an exemplar because it involves a lot of complicated ethical and privacy questions. So in some ways, one of the hardest things about this study was getting access to the data. And you can understand why, because this data is incredibly granular and potentially very sensitive and very hard to anonymize. So we'll talk much more about that later. But the way that the, one of the things that prevents more research, let's say you really like this study and you really want to help uh, eliminate poverty and you want to do more like this, you can't just go and get this data. Right? That, that, so a big barrier to work in this particular area is data access. And, this is, and that is because of the complicated ethical and privacy things. And that is something we'll see throughout the two weeks. Another thing about this that I think is an exemplar that we'll see again and again is it combines what I would call ready-made and custom-made. So I think an analogy to art is helpful. So this is Fountain by Duchamp. <coughs> this is a ready-made Duchamp sort of walked around and he saw this and he said, oh, this was supposed to be a urinal, but I can see this and I see that it's more than a urinal. I see this as art. And so he took something for one purpose and he repurposed it. And that, that is exactly what I would say Blumenstock did. The call data was never created to measure poverty, but he said, oh, I realized I can repurpose this and use it for something that it was never intended to do. That kind of repurposing is very common in the style of data scientists. And when it's done well, it's really amazing. Because like ready-mades, it kind of changes what you think art is. Now, that is a style that many social scientists are not very accustomed to. Social scientists generally have more of a Michelangelo model, which is that they, when they want to make David, when he, Michelangelo wanted to make David, he didn't like walk around looking for something that kind of looked like David. He said, no, I want to make David, and I'm going to spend three years uh, making David. And so this style you could think of much more as a custom made style, which is much more common in social science, much less common in data science. And what I like about the Blumenstock et al. paper is that it blends these two things together. So it uses the ready made phone data and it uses the custom made survey data. And both of these, either one of these individuals would not have been enough. It was only the combination of these elements that allowed them to achieve their scientific objectives. And so now some of what we see is some kind of grumpy arguments between people about, well, like, is Twitter <coughs> data better than the general social survey or some su survey data, right? You probably heard some of these arguments. And I think those kind of arguments are, in the absence of some goal, hard to adjudicate, right? So for some things, the Twitter data is clearly better. For other things, the traditional survey data is clearly better. And I think increasingly what we'll see is for lots of things, these two things are better together than either of them individually, just in the way that this Blumenstock paper is. So I think increasingly we'll see studies that combine these ready-mades and custom-mades. Uh, and the last thing about this paper that I think is, is par part of why it illustrates a lot of what we'll see is that it really combines five different communities that I think make up the broader computational social science community. 
there are social scientists, there are data scientists, there are business people. So to get access to this data, they needed to work with the people from the mobile phone company. There are privacy advocates. These are people who want this sensitive data to be protected. And then there are policymakers who are potentially the ultimate customers of some of this research. And so I think a big thing about computational social science going forward will be to keep a healthy balance between these different communities. So that the push and pull between these communities creates an ecosystem where things move forward in a healthy way. And you can imagine, though, if one of these communities becomes dominant, then you get a horrific monoculture. So if this became only social scientists, for example, I can use that example because I'm a social scientist, I think the field would be much less interesting and it would progress much more slowly. Uh, likewise, if it became only data scientists or only business people or only privacy advocates or only policymakers, again, I don't think you would see the kind of healthy evolution, healthy push and pull that we'll see. So a lot of you here represent some of these different communities. And so it's very important for you while we're doing this to express your point of view, because that's part of creating a healthy ecosystem. And that's going to help us all move forward. So I should also say, which I meant to say at the beginning, that if you have any questions or comments, please just jump right in. This is more like a conversation than a lecture. So um, we'll try to create a healthy ecosystem here, which will go out and spread into the, the rest of the world. Um, so that's sort of some of the themes that I think we'll see repeatedly throughout uh, in terms of what is computational social science. Um, I mean, one question that also comes up a lot is, isn't computational social science just a fad? So the, the book that you all have read, um, I worked on that book for about five years, and I heard this question a lot. Uh, usually, like, late at night, someone would see me working on it, and they're like, this, Matt, what are you doing? This is just a fad. Like, you're spending all this time on this. And the answer, I think, to this question is there's a very easy answer to this question. Isn't this just a fad? No, this is not just a fad. <laughs> um, why am I so confident this is not just a fad? Um, so it is true that there are lots of fads in academia. Um, but a lot of those fads are driven by things that are happening internal to academia. It's like, Oh, uh, in sociology, something like this could happen. I'm sure you could insert your favorite terms from your field. It becomes cool to be Marxist. So then lots of people start to become Marxist. Then there's lots of Marxists. Then it becomes cool to be anti-Marxist. So then lots of anti-Marxists come. And then it becomes, there's enough of them that then it becomes cool to be anti-anti-Marxist. And you get these like fashion cycles. And those fashion cycles are kind of divorced from what's happening in the world. And so there, I think you can get fads when there's no sort of underlying driver to them. But with computational social science, there is a fundamental driver that is happening with us or without us, and that is the transition from the analog to the digital age. And that transition is happening. That transition will continue to happen with or without us. And either we can get on board and take advantage of all of that energy, or I think, quite frankly, we can be left behind. That is what I see as our choices. Um, this is a little graphic to illustrate that. This is the supposedly the amount of information in the world, which is obviously a very hard thing to quantify. There's sort of two patterns to note here. Um, this is the amount in 1986, 93, 2000, 2007. So you see first, more and more information. Second, you see more and more of it is being stored in a digital format, which makes it amenable to lots of different kinds of research. So the other thing about this is that this has kind of a Moore's Law-like behavior of doubling every two years. So this is from 2007. So if we double, double again, it's 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. Right, this is 2007. So right now, this is 32 times this. Like, just in the amount of time, like, this would be taller than the building or something. So, and these trends will continue for the foreseeable future. Um, so, but that does not mean there are not a lot of fad-like elements in what's happening. So this is one way I like to think about computational social science, which it turns out is a good model for lots of innovations. This is a figure that was developed by Gartner, which is a consulting company. 
So the x-axis here is time, the y-axis is visibility, so something happens, and then all of a sudden everyone is very excited about this thing. So big data is going to save the world and cure cancer and end poverty and suffering and make everyone happy and all kinds of great things. Uh, then it's like, uh, big data has all these problems. It's not really so good, the sampling, and there's all this kind of algorithmic bias in the data. And then over time, people <coughs> sort of push through those problems and they get to this plateau of productivity where this just becomes kind of a normal part of how people do their work. And so I think one of the goals of this institute is to sort of push down this peak, pull up this trough, and then get us here as quickly as possible. And so as a sort of sociologist, I would like to say a little bit about what I think this plateau will look like in sociology. For those of you who are in different fields, you could imagine what this will be in your field. Um, so one is I think that it doesn't really change our goals. It just changes our means of achieving those goals. So our goals are still the same. We just have new ways of doing it. So an x-ray machine doesn't change the goals of a doctor. It just helps the doctor do her work better, right? And the second thing is it doesn't displace all other techniques. So just because the doctor has an x-ray machine doesn't mean the doctor would never talk to a patient or like do a physical examination. That would be crazy, right? So this is just another thing that adds to what we have, but not completely displacing what we've done before. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to just say one thing that I think how we're going to create this community is going to be bringing together ideas from different fields, and that's what we're really excited about here. You're going to see that there are challenges when you try to bring these ideas together in terms of language, in terms of common understanding of goals, and this is something we'll work through throughout the Institute, and Chris will talk um, much more about that. And so I will just say, let's get started. So thank you. Chris? Thank you.